If you have your Bibles with you this morning, open with me to Matthew chapter 11 once again. If you're visiting with us in the house, we're glad that you're here. If you have a good time, my name is Philip Cochran. If you have a terrible time, my name is Daniel Williams. And I'm glad that you all are here. Uh, just write that down. I'll give you my email address later. <laughs> By the way, speaking of email addresses, don't start recording yet because I'm going there. I am off of Facebook now and forever. I have left the building. Remember when Elvis used to take off his scarf and throw it out and leave the building? I'm Elvis. I left my scarf and I left the building. I cannot stand social media anymore. I just can't do it. And I know y'all are like, no, 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 no. You'll, 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 you'll do something else, man. Get, turn your stupid thing off and get away from that mess. It's, it's messing your life up. It's, and my, my wife even told me this week, she said, I am so much happier that you're different when you're not around that stuff. So just turn it off, spend more time in the real world, and if you need to get a hold of me, you can call the church or you can get my email address, and we'll help you that way, but I'm not on Messenger, I'm not on Facebook. Uh, Elvis has left the building. <laughs> has left the building. I'm not going. I'm not going back. So I had the spirit of Elvis just swept over me for a second. Oh. <laughs> That's the only clip that'll make YouTube this week. <laughs> Pastor thinks he's Elvis. Did you know they think Elvis is still alive? <laughs> Janice, are you in the building? Yes, there you are. The biggest Elvis fan that I've ever known in my life. She's got Elvis pillows, socks. She's got everything. She's... You told me the other day that they still think he's alive. And we've got family that is traveling across the country to go see this guy that they think is Elvis. Matthew chapter 11, if you have your Bibles, turn there with me, please, this morning. I don't want to get sued. Matthew 11 and verse 2. This is a moment when he is sending out his disciples, and when John heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, listen to this question, that John Baptist sent his disciples to ask Jesus, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? The King James rendering of that says, are you he that should come or, do we look, or look we for another? Jesus answered and said to them, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. We'll, we'll stop there. You see the significance of that moment. John is now in prison for having told King Herod that he was in an unlawful relationship. He was locked up in prison and eventually lost his head in beheading. But in his moment, in that moment, he had this doubt that he sent disciples to Jesus and asked him, are you, are you the one or not? People ask me all the time, one of the most common questions I've gotten over the years is, how is it that you decide what is going to be the thing for that day that you're going to speak about on that particular day? Obviously, there are a lot of answers to that question, but one of my most common answers is this, is that I have a lot of conversations with a lot of people. I have a lot of conversations with a broad cross-section of people, and so many times, unknown to one another, what I find is that all of them are going through very similar circumstances. So many of the people that I have conversations with, they haven't talked to one another, they don't know one another, but... As I talk to this one and that one and that one, I find out that all of these people are going through many of the exact same things. And recently, the most common comments that I'm hearing are from people who are having a moment where their faith has been shaken. Based on the last two or three years, you could say, well, that would seem to be, you know, a, a, a foregone conclusion, but it's, it's not like that. It's, it's in this recent moment through circumstances and issues and challenges that they are facing, for the first time, many times, in a long time, or even in their lives, they're confused. They're confused about something that they didn't think they would ever be confused about. About a, about a year ago, I sat with a pastor who was going through a dark moment in his life, and he, he said to me, he said, I don't even know if I believe what I used to believe anymore at all. I don't even know what to believe anymore. So this morning, I want to talk with you about... Shaken faith. When your faith gets shaken. 
And maybe it will resonate with you in this moment. Maybe that is a place where you are right now. Something has happened or not happened. Maybe you're having a challenge. Maybe you're going through a, a dark time or an issue in your life, and you, you, you're finding yourself asking questions maybe that you never thought you would ask. This morning we're going to go after this. I'm praying that God will say something that will resonate with all of us. Let's pray and just believe God. Father, we thank you for this moment that we have together. Let your word become lamp and light to our path, God. Just pray that in these next few minutes, God, you would say something that somebody needs to hear more than they know, and we thank you for it. And they said together, amen. I talk about it from time to time, not very often, but I talk about it from time to time because it was one of the most defining moments in my life. And I find that from time to time it's good for me to share the, the story, and, and every time I do, people find some comfort in that. My dad uh, died of leukemia uh, 22 years ago in 2000, and I was 38 years old when he died, so I was not a child, I was a full, full grown man. My dad had come down with it three years earlier than that in 1997. He had gotten sick. He didn't tell us at the time, but the doctors had given him a 5% chance of survival. When they diagnosed his leukemia, they gave him a 5% chance of survival. He never told us that, but what we did see is that his treatment was incredibly aggressive. My dad went into St. Luke's Hospital in Jacksonville. They immediately put him into the ICU unit, and they put him into an aggressive chemotherapy and radiation treatment. He was there for 45 days. Uh, he came out on Christmas Eve, 1997. And I just remember that when the big, strong man, my dad, got out of his car at his house, it was the first time that we had seen him in weeks, and he was definitely not the same man that had gone in the hospital but obviously, we were all excited to have him home. We were Christmas Eve. What better time? But then, in typical fashion of my dad, he later told us what the doctors had told him. That when he was diagnosed and when he went in for treatment, that he had only a 5% chance of surviving. No matter what they did, it was, it was, it was going to be that way. 95% chance of failure. A 5% chance of survival. And so when he came home, we were all convinced that it was an absolute miracle from God. That God had done something for him. That they, they declared, the doctors declared his disease to be in complete remission. And my dad went right back to life. Within, within weeks, he was back to work. Within months, his hair had grown back. Um, he was right back to being his normal self, up before the sunrise, going out to work a full day, come home after sunset. Funny, happy, strong, everything that he was. We all lived with the feeling that you get when God has done something. And you all know that feeling, and if you don't, you need to. That feeling that you get down inside of you when you know, man, God just did something, and you can't wait to tell everybody about it. And everywhere you go, you tell everybody about it. Because that's exactly what we did, man. We would go anywhere in town. People say, how's your dad? And we say, man, he's great. God raised him up. God healed him. He's fine. He's back to work. And, no, yeah, he's back to work. We would tell everybody what God had done for my dad. Three years later, on May the 21st, which was a Sunday, I finished the morning service over on Kings Estates Road just like this. And always... Always, always, when I walked off the platform, the first hand that I shook was my dad. Dad always sat right over here. He would always meet me at the altar. He would shake hands. We would have a few moments of conversation, and then we would go on with, with our day. But on that particular day, he wasn't there. I walked off the, the platform, and I looked around, and Dad was gone. And so I asked one of our ushers, I said, where's, where's Dad? And they said, uh, he's, in his, he's in the car. He's not feeling well. And it was strange because my dad was never sick. So I walked out to the car. And dad was just sitting there. And you could tell he was obviously not feeling well. And I said, what's going on? He said, I'm not feeling good, son. But he said, I've got an appointment with the doctor on Monday, tomorrow. So I'm sure everything's going to be fine. When I'm done with the appointment, I'll call you and let you know. He finished with his appointment on Monday. He got home that evening and he called us. He called the whole family and he said, could y'all all show up here, meet me at the house on Tuesday? And so we did. Tuesday morning we all showed up there and, and my dad opened up his mouth and told this story. He said, doctors have told me I've got two weeks to live. 
But he said, he said, I know myself. He said, I've got two days. So everything that we need to do, <laughs> typical, typical Menorcan. <laughs> Tough as nails. Everything we got to do, we got to do it. Everything we got to say, we got to say it. So we did. The next two days, we stayed together. It was glorious. Talking conversation. Uh, Wednesday morning, he got up, and he struggled. And we all knew what was coming. He woke up, he struggled, and he passed away. I mean, in, in, in minutes. And I've told this story literally hundreds of times that I completely fell apart. At the age of 38, I had been a Christian for a long time. I knew what I knew. I knew all of this stuff, but I fell apart. I had already, and I told our church this over on Kings Estate Road, I had already been dealing with a mild depression for seven years. Listen, if you're in ministry, you're probably depressed. <laughs> I was dealing with a mild, <laughs> y'all are hard, y'all. Church folk are mean. I was dealing with a mild depression for seven years, but when this happened, it, my life bottomed out. It, it bottomed out in a way that I'd never experienced in my life. I'd I personally did not want to go on with anything. I didn't want to go on with ministry. I didn't want to go on with life. But what was, what was worse than that, the, the darkest part of it all, was that for the first time in a long time, I questioned everything about my faith. I was shaken. And it became one of the darkest times of my life. It was dark. Some of you were there with me, and you, you know what I'm talking about. It was a... It was a a dark time, and I, and I tell you this so that you will understand that when I talk to you about shaken faith, I'm not talking to you from a clinical or an ecclesiastical viewpoint where, yeah, I've never, I've never had to deal with that, but I know y'all have. No, I've been there, and I know exactly how it feels. The good news is that 11 months later, on Wednesday night... <laughs> Woo, May the, 20, May the 2nd, 2001, I had an encounter with God that lasted just a few short minutes. God transformed my life, and I have got, walked in the strength of that moment of transformation from this moment, that moment until this moment. And I can stand here and tell you something, that His joy today is my strength. I have learned how to live and walk by faith in God and one of the greatest revelations that I've gotten in my life is one that I got from the Lord's Prayer that I shared with you all just a few weeks ago in Matthew chapter 6. One of the elements of that prayer that is spoken so many times but hardly ever understood, and it's this, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Amen. We say it all the time, y'all. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. We, we, those words just kind of fall out of our mouth. But I don't know that we mean it, and I don't know that we understand it. Because when you pray that, what you are doing is releasing control of your life into His hands. And when, you're, when you mean it, what you're doing is actually stepping into the greatest kind of faith of them all that says, listen, I surrender all. I surrender everything, and I, God, I trust you completely. So that no matter how this turns out, I trust you. No matter how this looks or feels, I'm going to trust you. Whether it's good or bad, whether it makes me happy or sad, whether I win or whether I lose, if this person lives or if this person dies, if I come to a period of great success or if all I do is suffer, I trust you. I trust you. And having done this for as long as I have now, I think I've earned the right to speak to you all and say that so many times when we say that, we have a picture in our head that looks like a vacation video. Yes, we do. We, we, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's like a vacation video that's playing in my head. I trust the Lord, so here's what I know. Good things are going to happen for me. Life is going to be really good. Problems are going to be gone. Depression is going to be over. Victory is going to happen. I'm happy. I win. We, we, like, like, like this, like if I say that I'm willing, then it won't happen. See, if I say that I'm willing to, to just, God, just whatever you do, I, I'm willing. Your kingdom come, your will be done. As if, if I say that, then I, he'll know I'm willing. And so none of that will come. 
But what you now know is that all of that stuff happens. <laughs> Sometimes you walk in victory so much, victory in your life that you can't even stand yourself, man. Good things are happening all around you. But what you find out is that stuff happens and a lot of stuff happens as well. And if you don't understand that, you can get shaken in ways that you never thought possible. And anyone who has ever walked down that road knows exactly what I'm talking about. Somebody testify. By the year 2000, I'm going to be honest with you all, by the year 2000, I had stood in a lot of hospital rooms. I hated every time. I stood in a lot of hospital rooms by a lot of dying people. And I would do the preacher thing. I'd say, it's going to be all right. You're going to make it. No matter what happens, man, you're going to be all right. God's going to come through. It's going to, we'll just pray and God's going to do something. But when it happened to me, the first thing I said was, hey, this ain't fair. This is not right. This is not fair. This God, this God who said he cares so much about me, apparently he doesn't care about me as much as I thought he cared about me or he would have just answered my prayer that I just gave him. Somebody who loves you, and I do, needs to tell you this, that life is not always easy. Faith, this walk of faith that you're in right now, if you say, Lord, I give you my life, it's not always easy. This is as real as it gets. You can be living your life, doing what the Word says, loving God, loving people, doing everything right, and you can still have things happen in your life that do not fit the narrative of how I thought it was going to be. When my dad got sick, I said, hold up, ho, ho, ho. That's not fair. He's a good man. He's never smoked, he's never drank, he's never treated anybody wrong. That's not right. This makes no sense. But then when he got better, I said, come on, look at God. See, now you're, now you're running heaven like I thought you were supposed to. I'm just saying, if you'd asked me, that's what I'd have told you. That's what I'd have done. So, good job, high five. Good job. But when he died, my faith got shaken. And we're going after this today because when your faith gets shaken, and I hope that I'm talking to somebody who completely understands what I'm saying, when your faith gets shaken, one of the doors that swings wide open is deception. From that moment on, when your faith gets shaken, you'll believe any lie that comes your way. In Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said to Eve and Adam, is that what God really said? Is that, come on, is that what God really said? And even though they knew that was exactly what God had said, they doubted Him. Their faith got shaken. When your faith gets shaken, higher is harder, and lower becomes your new normal. Somebody ought to write that down. It's hard to get higher. It's hard to get that feeling. It's hard to get your joy back. When you, your faith gets shaken, higher is harder and lower becomes the next level. But we change the name. We call it something else. It's called depression. In Matthew chapter 14, Peter saw Jesus walking on water and he said, Lord, I want to do that too. Jesus said, come on. He stepped out on the boat, of the boat and he started walking on the water. But the Bible says that when he looked around and he saw the waves boisterous, he was afraid and he began to sink. Brothers and sisters, that sinking is a metaphor for what happens in your life when you start looking at your circumstances and your faith starts to sink along with it. You might not be on water, but you're on sinking sand. See, that's, that's why we're, this morning we're going to look at three people who had a moment. John Baptist, Thomas, and Peter. This moment in Matthew 11 has sustained me in my walk of faith more than once. More than once. I've gone to Matthew 11 and said, thank God. Why? Because John had a normal reaction. See, for a long time, I thought people in the Bible were seven feet tall, they wore white robes, and they had a halo. Anybody else? I thought my pastor was like that. I thought these people who in the Bible were like seven feet tall, they wore white robes, and they glided everywhere they went. They are just like... They never had a moment. But man, I look at John. I mean, John knew Jesus. He saw the Spirit of God descend from heaven like a dove and heard the voice from heaven saying, that's him. God didn't say it like that. He said, this is my beloved son. So John heard that. 
This man, was, he devoted his life to preaching the kingdom of God. He was a lion. Man, when the Pharisees and the scribes showed up, he said, you're a bunch of snakes. Not only you're a snake, your mama's a snake, your daddy's a snake, and his mama's a snake. This dude was a lion, man. But yet, when, listen, listen, here's the key. When things didn't work out like he thought they should, the first thing he did was question whether Jesus was even the Messiah. How? What a question. Are you him or not? Despite his reputation as a doubter, you find that Thomas was actually one of the disciples who was more sold out to Jesus than most of them. So much so that when Jesus said to his disciples, we're going to Jerusalem, <laughs> they're going to kill me. They go, we're going to Jerusalem to die. Everybody else had their hands in their pockets. But the man we call Doubting Thomas in John chapter 11 said, let's go. <laughs> uh, you got to be around some people like that. They don't even think about it. Well, let's go. The rest of the disciples were like, calm down. Let's go. But when Jesus died, when Jesus actually died, and then they came to Thomas and told him, wait a minute, wait a minute, we're wrong, he's alive. Thomas said, now unless I, unless I put my finger in the holes and put my hand in his side, I don't know that I'm going to believe that. I don't, I, don't, I don't believe it. Peter was the same. Peter was the same. Peter was sold out to Jesus. I mean, he was awesome. He walked on water. He... Defended Jesus in the garden. Jesus called him the rock. And yet he denied Jesus three times because of what was going on in his life in that moment. I'm telling you this, that one of the greatest tools that the devil has is to shake your faith and cause you to doubt something that you were once sure of by using circumstances to cause you to forget what you know that God has already done and is still doing. That's one of the devil's greatest tools. If you're feeling it right now, this word from God is directly just for you. Sight told John, you're in jail for doing the right thing, and the one that you thought cared about you is doing nothing. Actually, he's out there living life and having a good time. You are forgotten. Sight told Thomas, he just died. It's over. It doesn't get any more over than that. Sight told Peter, they killed him, and if you say that you're with him, they're going to kill you next. But faith says, faith says, God, faith says God is able even when he doesn't. God is able even when he doesn't. And I thought he was going to, but he doesn't. God is good even when it doesn't look like it at all. God is with you even when it feels like He is a thousand miles away from where you are. God cares even when it looks like He has completely forgotten who you are. That is why, brothers and sisters, the only way that we should do this is to do it like the Word of God says. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. Let's, let, me, let, me, let me do my Philip thing and put some shoes on this. Life I was going to say something else, but I'll say it this way, is hard. If you've got an easy life, you need to wake up every day and thank God for it because life is hard. What's that look like? People let you down. Trials happen. Trouble comes. Sickness happens. Tires go flat. <laughs> Cars break down. Families fight. Your little home all of a sudden turns into a war zone. Loved ones die. People we love, people we care about, they die. Marriages cool off. Church folks, I'm about to shock you, church folks can be ungodly. I know, I didn't believe it either. It's like all these Jesus people, man, hang out with them. They're going to treat you nice. <laughs> people let you down. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, you already said that. I know. I'm going to say it again. Prayers. Prayers seem to go unheard and unanswered. 
Money comes and money goes. Sometimes things are not easy. Sometimes we don't understand what's happening and our faith gets shaken. But you remember this, please. Everything that you see looks different depending on what it is that you are looking at. Everything in life is how you see whatever it is that you are looking at. So I'm going to rock your world and tell you this. Shaking is good. If you're shaking, hang in there, y'all. Shaking is good. James chapter 1 and verse 3 says, The trying of your faith produces. Stop there. I don't need to know everything else. It produces patience and all this other stuff, but it produces something good is happening as a result of this shaking that's going on in my life. In 1 Peter 1, 7, Peter said, The trying of your faith is much more precious than gold that perishes. It's priceless. It's valuable. Shaking. Listen. Settles things like nothing else can. Shaking settles things like nothing else can. Dad died, and I fell to pieces. I was mad. You let me down. I remember as he was dying, standing at the window of my dad's house, looking out at the river, and saying, God, if you're going to do something, you've got to do it now. And he did. He took him home. Dad died and I fell to pieces. Ten years later, ten years after that, my wife's sister, Awana, got brain cancer. The worship leader on this platform for 25 years got brain cancer and died. But this time, I understood. I didn't like it, not for one moment, but I didn't blame God. And to this day, Her funeral is one of the greatest celebrations that we've ever had in this church. We've never done anything that touched us more than that. Seven years later, I stood with my sister at 3 a.m. in the morning. I lived two miles from my mom. My mom called me and she said, you better come now. Brenda had brain and lung and breast cancer. And I went to her bedside and I stood there with her. And as she was struggling to breathe at 3 o'clock in the morning, I prayed. And when she passed, I smiled. I smiled. On January 2021, 22 years after my dad died, my mom died. And I did nothing but rejoice. From then until now, at the goodness of God. Do you see? (laughs) Do you see the transformation? I went from falling apart to coming to the place to where when my precious mother passed away, I was able to just say, thank you, Jesus. Because I settled this. And you need to settle this, that God is good no matter what. Somebody still hasn't settled that. You've got to settle that. God is good no matter what. No matter what is going on in my life, God is good. And His mercy endures forever. God is good no matter what it feels like to you. Somebody who hears that probably wants to punch me in the face. Bad move. Hang with that, though. And feel that. Thursday morning of this week, I got to the office and, and, and it, was, whew, it was the day that we were doing the, the, the Thanksgiving food giveaway. So I had like, listen, 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 30-something messages on the church's messaging machine. I don't have a secretary, so you know who answers that. So I'm going through this thing, and there was one woman who called, and she was frantic, and you could just tell she was frantic, so I immediately called her back. This woman had, I mean, so much going on in her family. I was like, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody, and while they're talking, you're looking at the phone going, "Woo!" That was me on Thursday. She's telling me just everything that's going on in her life, and it was all bad. She has a, a sister who is dying of cancer. At that moment, another son who has pneumonia, another son who has multiple sclerosis. 
all this stuff that's going on, they, she's not able to work, and so her bills are piling up, and she doesn't know if she's going to be able to stay in her house, and then someone else had a slab leak in their house, like some of y'all have experienced that before, water is just gushing up underneath the floor, and I'm looking at the phone thinking, Lord, have mercy. And right before I could say anything, you know what she said to me? She said to me, I'm rejoicing today because I know that God is working. I said, yeah, me too, yeah. I just, yeah, he sure is. And I said, God, give me that kind of faith. Because I'd have been the one spitting nails around the house. Anybody else? I'd have been mad. I'm going to finish with a few little things. Here it goes. Trouble is where you find out what you really believe. Is your faith real or is it convenient? I fear for the New Testament church that most of the time our faith is convenient. Trouble is where you find out where what you believe is what you believe. In the 21st century church, God's love is equated with leisure. I said it. And so when you get leisure, you feel loved. When you find yourself at a time of leisure, you're like, oh, God really loves me. Look here. But when anything other than that comes along, you get shook. It took me a long time and a lot of dark valleys to, to learn that. So what about those unshakable people? You know them. You know, y'all know a couple of them. I used to know a couple. They died. <laughs> What about those unshakable people? Those people that, you ever met them, that they've got that faith that's just like unshakable. This lady on the phone, unshakable. People that you know that go through stuff, man, one thing after another, and you're like, oh, my God. And they just make it through. Well, let me, let me tell you the secret. Faith that can't be shaken is the result of faith that has already been shaken. Amen. That's good right there. Y'all go put that on Facebook today and know that I won't see it. I was thinking earlier, <laughs> faith that can't be shaken is the result of faith that has been shaken before, but now you know. And now you know what Job knew. And this morning when you sang that line in that song, I about jumped out of my skin. Job 42.5, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Amen. See, I, I, I heard some things about this stuff, and I've heard some things about challenge and test. I've heard some things about stumbling, but now, God, my eye sees you. I see who you are. I see what you can do, and I recognize who you are. Lastly, if you guys would come, never forget, never forget, if you will, the all things element of this whole mess. You know what I'm talking about? The all things element of this whole thing. Listen, somewhere along the way, you're going to get shaken, it's coming. You may be there right now. But in your shaking and in your trials and in your troubles, don't forget this all things element that happens. The Word of God says, all things work together for good. To the, it's not a cliche. It's not a spiritual saying. It's the Word of God. All things work together for good to those who love God. He's working it out. He's working it out. He's working it out. How can you see this is going to be good? I don't know. But that's what his word says, and so that's what I'm going to stand on. I was in the office just a few moments before I came out praying this morning, and I realized, I had a realization that if my dad had not died, I would not be the man that I am today. because he was everything to me. When I had trouble, honestly, sometimes I didn't run to God, I ran to Dad. My first phone call, Dad, what do I do? And when he was gone, I think that's why I freaked out so bad. At 38 now, I'm on my own. I gotta do this myself. All things work together for good. I'm the man I am today, in part because he went home when he did. And never forget this, that according to the Word of God, the Bible says that He makes all things beautiful in His time. He makes all things beautiful in His time. 
I could preach that all afternoon. I love to be able to testify and say that right now my family is experiencing that. A lot of years of being blown apart, we're all together again. It's such a beautiful thing. He makes all things beautiful in His time. So let's believe this stuff together. Let's go after this together. I, I just, what I want us to do this morning is pray wherever prayer is needed. If you're, if you're in that shaking or if you've been shaken and maybe you're in that season where you're just not sure about what God is all about and what God is doing, I would love to pray this morning for a restoration. I would love to see God restore faith in this room this morning. People who've had doubts or fears or concerns, I would love to see God just restore your faith to a place or at least begin the process of restoring your faith to a place. Let's pray together. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. More to us than a line and a prayer, God. Father, this morning, this is one of those deeper things. This is one of those deeper works. So, Father, I pray that in this moment we would just release ourselves to this ministry of your Spirit. With heads bowed and hearts open this morning. If you are right now in a time of great challenge, let me, let me assure you it is not by accident. Be sober. Be vigilant because your adversary as a roaring lion walks around seeking whom he may devour he is looking for that eventual goal the thief comes not but for to steal kill and destroy to steal to kill to destroy heads bowed hearts open I haven't told that part of the story as much but I was so shook that I was leaving, I was leaving the ministry. I was going back into business. I was, I was done. God restored me. From then to now, I've gone in the strength of that restoration. So this morning, I want us to pray together for anyone who might find yourself in a similar circumstance right now. And maybe your prayer is, God, just restore me. Restore me back to that place of trusting you. God, heal me from this hurt, whatever it is. Restore my faith, God. I submit myself to you. I surrender all, not some. I surrender all to you today. I know that the secret things belong to you, but I trust that your word is true. You will make all things beautiful in your time, and I submit myself and surrender to doing that today this is a powerful moment y'all I'm praying for restoration I'm praying for restoration I'm praying for restoration I'm praying for breakthrough I'm praying that God will help you break through in this moment everything the enemy has done to bring you to this place that God will break through that your testimony is going to include all of that, but it's not going to stop there. It's not going to stop at that worst moment on your worst day. It's not going to stop there. It's going to continue on. And you're going to find greater things ahead. He makes all things beautiful in His time. I'm ready for some of that. I'm ready for some of that beautiful things. This morning, let God do this in your life. All across the building, if you wouldn't mind, together, let's stand, please. y'all will come. I'm just going to open the altars to you and whatever you have a need for prayer about just come on and find a place to pray. Let's just reach out and touch the hem of his garment today. You may be a, that person that this is just reaffirming something with you this morning and this may be the moment that you've been waiting for to get just to sit at his feet. Just to sit at his feet and to firm up that foundation. 
Altar workers are here to minister to you. If you haven't even prepared, come on. Let's just pray. praise the Lord. Quick questions, quick poll. How many of you have ever had your faith shaken? I just want to make sure I'm talking to the right crowd. And I don't mean not, let, watch, let me redo that. Let me redo that. Not just that you had a bad day or you had a flat tire or something like that. I'm talking about the kind of stuff that shakes you to your very core and you're thinking, I don't know if I want to do this much anymore. Anybody? There's just a, a lot in it. See? It's common. It's common. It's not just you. It's not just, that's what the enemy does. That's how the devil works. Oh, I'm the only one. Nobody else is dealing with this, so let me just keep my mouth shut. And let me ask you this. How many of you now can look back in hindsight and recognize that not only was it a difficult time, but now in hindsight it has turned out to be one of the greatest, listen, one of the greatest blessings that's ever happened in your life. Well, there you go. There you go. Behold the goodness of God. That's what God does. He takes all the ashes and gives it beauty. So He's at work. And if you're here this morning and your faith is shaken, and you're not yet to that point where you're, you're, you know, you're ready to make any commitments one way or the other. Let me just tell you, you're not alone. And you're not the only one. Your story may be completely unique, but let me tell you, we've, we've all been there. You saw the hands. We've all been there. That's what the devil does is to cause you to look at your circumstances and go, well, I didn't think it was going to be like this. I didn't think it was going to look like this. God is good. Even when it doesn't look like He is. God is there even when He seems a long way away. He's got you. He's faithful. Can I pray for you and send you out back to the, the world that you're supposed to go be a blessing to? Go be a blessing to the world that you're in. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the Word today. Let your Word today change someone's life to the core. The very direction, the very steps of their life, God, let it transform. We pray, God, that as we go out of this place, day by day, moment by moment, God, your Holy Spirit of God, your Holy Spirit will continue to work within us, continue to give revelation. Father, bring us healing and restoration, God. Bring those people that are struggling back to that place of first love. Let everything that we do, God, bring you glory. And God, let us wait for those moments when you make everything beautiful in your time. I give you praise. And I thank you for every day. It's a blessing. They said together in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. God fellowship.